then let's get started with TypeScript and specifically black magic in TypeScript. Now, what's black magic? Well, according to the source of all knowledge, black magic is magic that is used for evil and selfish purposes. So that's what you're here for, evil and selfish uh, TypeScript. Okay, well, if you want to know more about being evil and selfish, you've come to the right person. Uh, hi, my name is Peter, and I'm not even a real programmer. I mostly do workshops and training for front-end development. So everything that happens in a browser is just right up my alley. So yeah, so much for, for evil. Um, I'm part of a podcast, Working Draft. Maybe you've heard of this. If not, um, go to workingdraft.de uh, and click subscribe. I also run a small startup that turns pattern libraries into um, test suites. So you can be sure that your user interface looks right. And of course, there's my website where you can just Call me or write an email if you want me to visit your company as well and talk a bit more about TypeScript or something else, maybe in, you know, not as a high gear as I'm going to be forced to talk, talk in today. So, um, what I want to, um, well, attempt is to make this uh, beautiful bit of TypeScript a bit more accessible to you. For many this looks really like black magic and probably evil and confusing, but this is actually really useful and it's worth knowing about. But unfortunately I only got uh, 55 minutes today, so we are not going to cover all of this, but I just want to open your mind a little. Maybe just to appreciate a bit um, about TypeScript's more, you know, obscure edges. So we will talk about stuff like this and this will um, take the following shape. First, we are going to talk about type inference and why using type inference in TypeScript is actually a really good idea. And why, why not using type inference is actually a really bad idea. Then, um, the interesting bit comes when we are actually writing types. Specifically, we are going to write fewer types and better types so that we, in the end, don't have to write any types at all. This sounds confusing now, but just wait me out. And in the end, um, I just want to offer a small outlook into even more advanced features in TypeScript that we can talk about maybe um, next year when we all come here again. Um, I have, um, according to my plan at least, um, quite a bit of time for questions afterwards. So if you have any questions that, that pop into your head, keep them there until the end. Okay. One uh, final thing uh, in preparation, we are not going to talk about object-oriented TypeScript as much, not so much class R extends B implements C, because this is not very exciting. The first thing, the function that takes some data and returns some new data, is actually more interesting, because, you know, TypeScript's object-oriented programming is modeled after C-sharp. C-sharp um, is a kind of reasonable language, so there's nothing interesting there. The dark arts are in the functions. So. I already told you what my core idea is. My core idea is that we should better and smarter types so that we can write fewer types. Because writing types is boring and unnecessary. Type inference. This is the first important bit. This is not just something that you can use, but I would say something that you should use. So, one feature of TypeScript that's always touted is that you can write type annotations to your variables. Yay! So, you can write you can explain to TypeScript that A is indeed going to be a number because apparently this is not clear from this line that A is going to be a number. No, of course this is clear. You can just omit the type annotation and TypeScript will figure out that A is supposed to be a number. Now, you can write the types or you can um, leave them out. Leaving them out is actually what I think you should do. Here's a more interesting example, something that's not just numbers. I have a type called customer, just an object containing an idea that's boring, and there's a function getById that takes a customer ID and returns a customer. The implementation is not important, this is all about the types. So this is just the definition of a, of a type and of a function that operates on the type. Now, if we wanted to use this customer module, we would just import the module and then we would maybe have some kind of render function that can take a customer and do something interesting with the customer. As you see, the implementations of all the functions are not as important, the types are what we are uh, here for. So, this looks kind of reasonable, right? There's this variable first in the second to last line. This is the result of get by ID, and this has the type customer. Of course, because the return type of the function is customer. Now, we could, if we wanted, also import the customer type from the module and write it um, as an annotation to first. This doesn't change anything about our program. 
first as a customer, now first as a customer, even with the annotation. So, why would you write the annotation? I don't know. Why would you? I mean, you would probably write customer if you um, are paid by you know how um, many keystrokes you perform in any given day. This is the reason, but it's not really necessary. The program is the same no matter if the annotation is there or not. And it's actually harmful, I would say. Now imagine our get by ID function would return a customer from the database, and this means that a customer of a given ID might not actually exist. So the function might return null. Now, if the function can return null, this program doesn't work anymore, of course, because we said first can only ever contain a customer. But why? Why would first only ever contain a customer? I don't see it. First is just a variable, and the variable in JavaScript, which is the basic basis for TypeScript, can contain any value, a customer and null. Now, um, removing this customer annotation doesn't actually introduce a bug, because a bug can only happen if we do something with this first variable that may contain a customer or may contain null. But this is the job of render. This is a part of the type annotation for the render function. The render function itself knows if it can handle null or a customer or just one of this. So if we have a problem, this problem should manifest itself in the render function and not in some arbitrary place in our code. If the problem doesn't manifest at all, this means we don't have a problem. Maybe render can deal with null, maybe it can't. But there's no reason to add this annotation at this place. In functions, yeah. In classes, if you um, like to write this sort of thing, of course but not in your everyday code unless there's a reason for this. This even produces a better error message, right? This program can't work because render can take null. The error message here is uh, this program can't work because first can take a null. I mean, that's technically correct, but not very reasonable. So, I would postulate that premature type annotations are the root of all evil. They make TypeScript code hard to refactor and very verbose. So, just leave them out whenever you can. There's a compiler option for TypeScript, no implicit any, that will teach TypeScript to basically complain every time the type inference can't figure out any type. And this is the um, time and place to add an annotation. But other than that, no way. Okay, now we've seen where type annotations aren't really um, helpful. Maybe there's some places where type annotations actually can help. Now, this is again our customer, and now our customer has grown a bit. It's an object composed of many sub-objects. There's an array of addresses, a purchase history, and much more data, whatever this may be. Now, let's write a function that works with this customer, and this time actually with an implementation. Let's have a function immutable delete addresses. This takes a customer and an index, and this returns a new customer with the um, addresses um, less this address at the index that we passed it. So, creates a new customer, is an immutable, um, works with immutable data. Okay, that's not very hard to write in JavaScript. We just return a new object that contains everything from the previous object plus an addresses object, an ad addresses array, that's just um, without the address at the given index. So, a new array for the addresses all wrapped into a new object. This is just plain old JavaScript, not very interesting. Now, this works. TypeScript by now is actually smart enough to figure out that the return type here is a real customer because you know input at dot addresses is an array of strings for example this means addresses is an array of strings an array of strings plus everything else from the input is a new customer this works all just fine and the annotations here um, are in a function so they make sense now this is all nice and fine but let's remove the implementation for a bit so we can talk about types again and let's talk about writing a test for this function now the customer is a really, really complicated object. Contains many sub-objects, many arrays. So if we wanted to write test code like this, where we create a new customer from an input customer and um, re uh, compare the output customer to an expected customer, this means we need to have a bunch of complicated objects, right? These are all customer objects, and our function only takes full customer objects. So we either have to use some kind of working library or um, use some, I don't know, um, type assertions or just write a bunch of code. And writing a bunch of code is definitely not what I want to do. I want to do less work and not more. TypeScript, in this case, forces me to write complicated customer objects. If we take the um, function again, 
and just remove the type annotations and think about this function in JavaScript terms, this will actually work with any object that has a field called addresses, which is an array of something. So this is needlessly specific and makes writing tests really, really hard. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that there's a trade-off. JavaScript has one big advantage, namely that it's really dynamic. We can basically just take any old object that um, fulfills some kind of minimal requirements, stuff it into the function and it will just work. But on the other hand, this is a disadvantage because we can just take any object and shove it into any function, which is not what we want. So we use TypeScript, which is rigid and static and strict, which is fine, unless being rigid and static and strict is a disadvantage. This is just the trade-off between dynamic languages and static languages, but I um, won't take this. I want to have my cake and eat it too. And I can. Because TypeScript can be used in two ways. The first way, which is the most popular way, is basically transforming JavaScript into a statically typed mainstream programming language. Make JavaScript look like C-sharp or Java or something like this. And you can absolutely do this if you want to, but what you can, act can, you, what you can also do is to just provide some guardrails for JavaScript's dynamic nature. Basically, use TypeScript to take all of the features that JavaScript has and make them type safe. This is much more interesting, but of course requires you to think in JavaScript while you're writing TypeScript. But I'm going to try to com um, convince you that this is actually worthwhile. Now, this only works because TypeScript's type system is quite different from what you see, what you know from any other programming language, any other mainstream programming language, I should say. The customer is, of course, a compound data, data object, right? It contains many, many sub-objects. This is to be expected. What's maybe also to be expected, but not as widely known, is that in TypeScript you cannot just write a complicated compound data type, but you can um, dissect it again. You can write stuff like this. Previously, the sub-objects that a customer is composed of didn't have any own names, and if you wanted to have own names in other programming languages, you would have to write the components first and then compose the customer. But we can also decompose the customer if we feel like it. We can just take an, a type, a TypeScript type, and slice and dice it like we want to. So types can't just be constructed, they can also be deconstructed. And while this doesn't look like the most powerful operation, this is actually really, really um, interesting because it allows us to do stuff with types that we would usually only do with objects. And then we can write types that mirror what we do with objects. So TypeScript's types are programmable. The simplest example of this is what we've already seen. This is just the lookup type, where we just take a type and just access some kind of subtype, not subtype in the subtype sense, but a component of the, um, of the bigger type. So customer address is then just um, the type for an array of strings. But what's probably more interesting is something like this. Some object has a type. There's no type annotation, but of course, everything in TypeScript has a type. There's type inference, so there's some kind of type behind the variable, some object, but some object is just a runtime object, not a type. But we can construct a type from the runtime object. There's the type of operator, which of course is totally different from JavaScript's type of operator, hence the exactly same name. And the type of operator extracts, using type inference, the type of any runtime object that you pass to type of. Of course, any can also result from this, or unknown, or some other not as useful type. But in this case, some object type is actually the type of the object. So we can do this. This is interesting. And then, of course, there's many more operations. Just one example more. There's key of some object type, as we've seen, is an object that has two fields, foo and bar. And key of takes another type and produces a union type over the names of the fields of this object type. So foo um, and bar, the union of these two possible strings, is a type that we derived from the sum object type, which in turn we derived from a runtime object. So this is very, um, this is in terms of operations, quite basic, but it's very, very powerful and changes your way of thinking about types quite radically. OK, now let's use this um, knowledge to make our life actually simple. So, We've seen that there's this customer object and there's this immutable delete address function. 
where we've seen that in terms of JavaScript, a mutable delete address can operate on any old object, but in TypeScript, as written here, it must operate on a customer. But why would we constrain the function to um, a customer? Why not constrain this to any old object that has some characteristics that this function needs to work? Well, mainly an address is field. And we can actually do this, but for this we need generics or type parameters. You probably uh, know all this already. Um, to array in this case takes two values, returns an array, but the, because there's no type annotations on the function, the function will always return an array consisting of just any, which is the type for uh, I don't know. But if we add um, generics, just type parameters, like in your uh, favorite mainstream programming language, this can actually be turned into a more useful function. If we pass into strings, we get an array of strings. If we pass into numbers, we get an array of numbers. This looks reasonable. But there's another feature that's not widely known, and this is an extends clause in the type parameter on top in the function. T extends string, uh, or number, in this case a union type of string and number, basically means that there's a constraint on T. T can only be something that's assignable to the union of strings and numbers, meaning that this boolean um, in the last line, A3, is not a valid, a valid program. Why? Because we've written the constraints like this. And because we have type inference, we can even skip the um, type parameters in the function call because the type inference just takes care of this. And this, again, is very powerful. We cannot just say that there's some type variable in our function. We can actually model what this type has to contain to be compatible with this function, which is quite different from just saying well, it needs to be this type. So let's do this with our customer and with our newly learned black magic for TypeScript. OK, our old function takes a customer, returns a customer. We, of course, replace this with T for whatever T may be. Now, this program, of course, doesn't work because we assume that T contains a field of addresses, but TypeScript can't be sure because T can just be any old type. But we can constrain T to only accept um, objects that contain a field called addresses, and now here's the key. The addresses field needs to be compatible with whatever the customer has as addresses. We don't write just an array of strings because today our customer object has the addresses um, as an array of strings, we directly refer to the customer object to keep this function future-proof if we change the customer. Now, this is more to type, of course, but it more clearly um, communicates what the function, when we compile it to JavaScript, actually does, what it can do. This is just an artificial restriction on a function that can do so much more. We maybe want to write this because this is the first thing we think about when writing this function, but this is not really um, a description of what the function can do. The second thing is, the second um, uh, function signature describes what this JavaScript function can actually do. Or, in, in, uh, put it another way, this tells us what this function was originally meant to do. What was the person who wrote this function thinking at the time? But this tells us what the function can do. And this is just a way of thinking. I wouldn't actually recommend modeling a customer and functions in precisely this way, but this is an example to, to just open your mind to what TypeScript types can actually do for you. So, types, TypeScript types um, just not only allow us to lock down functions and objects, but also to make them to describe precisely what JavaScript does once the TypeScript script has been compiled to JavaScript. So we can write stuff that's more like JavaScript, but um, without sacrificing any of the type safety that TypeScript gives to us. And this is actually really useful in um, APIs that are more web-like, because you know a customer object. If I were to really write a customer um, object for my backend using Node.js and a database, yeah, you can bet I would use some ORM with some classes and just do th things in the simple way, but in the front end, simple just doesn't always work. Let's take message ports, for example. Ah. A message port um, is just uh, a built-in JavaScript class. You can create a new message port and you get back two port objects. And these two port objects can communicate with each other 
um, we can add a listener to port one um, and let, let this listener just do something. Just um, throw out the data in an alert box. So simple enough. We have to start port one to actually listen to events and then we can take port two, stuff some data inside and then this um, function um, at port one will trigger and we will see the output which of course is going to be uh, 42. Now, this is actually not JavaScript, this is TypeScript. There's no type annotation to be seen because type inference can do the job for us, right? Can it? I mean, what's the type of event.data, what we are stuffing into window alert up there? I mean, I know what the type should be, but I know what it isn't. It's definitely not, definitely not going to be number, this is going to be any. Why is this going to be any? Well, the type can actually be unknowable. In this case, um, the whole script is contained in one frame, in one page, in one script block. But this is definitely not always the case. I mentioned my uh, tiny little startup before. Yeah, this includes a, a browser extension, and a browser extension is just so much fun. It's basically a bunch of web pages that run inside a browser and that can only communicate in an indirect way using message passing. So anything you get from TypeScript, you can basically throw it out right when you try to write a browser extension. Even if you have TypeScript in two words, in one page and another page, or browsing context, and you have two ports that communicate with each other, whenever you put some type A into one port, you're definitely going to get any out of the other because the two um, browsing contexts, the two TypeScript build steps, don't know anything about each other, and they can't know anything about each other. But I want to do what I want to do now is fix this. If I put in type A at one end, I want to be sure that I only get type A at the other end. And um, I want to make this super convenient. I don't want to have to write any extra code for this. Now, I can't get away with writing no extra code, but I can get away with writing some extra code up front, and then when I use this um, uh, construct, the wrapper instances around the ports, then I don't have to write anything more. Using type inference. Okay, let's get started. First thing first, we write a type for messages. So this is of course going to be the groundwork for our message ob objects that we are going to pass around. Now, this is just going to be a mapping between a message name and a payload, what we are actually going to send. So the question will be a string and the answer will always be a number. This is just, um, this is not message objects, this is just a mapping describing the relationship between a message type on the left hand side and a payload on the right hand side. Now I'm going to write a class, just a wrapper around uh, a port. In the constructor I take a message port and start it. As we've seen, this is necessary to receive messages. And then this class is going to contain a send method, and the send method takes a type and a payload, and constructs a message object from the type and the payload, pushes it into the port, and then the other side, wherever this may be, can receive the message object. Makes sense, right? Well, but this code doesn't make sense. Because above, um, with the type messages, I said that there's only going to be two types of messages question and answer, nothing else. But the signature for send actually takes any string for type. Well, this can't be right. And the payload type, any? I mean, of course, if you write it like this, we cannot really say with certainty which payload this function should take for a given type, because the type can just be any string. Could be fubar, although that's not allowed. Well, this shouldn't be allowed. This should be locked down. So, this is what the runtime JavaScript will look like. We will just build an, an object um, with the type and the payload and put it into the port. Okay, but the function signature, that's not good enough. So let's fix this. Fix this. Let's start with the type. This is not going to be any old string. We will only allow a very specific subset of strings here and we can derive the subsets simply from our messages. Now, this is a, bit, a, a much, much to take in. So there is a uh, type variable, a generic called type, um, and this has to be a string that's assignable to the um, number of strings that come when we get the keys from messages. Messages has as keys question and answer, so there's two possible strings and type has to be one of them. Now it's impossible to call send with any old string, but there can only ever be two strings, question and answer, or rather 
the strings that can be passed as a type are defined in this um, messages type at the top. And then, of course, once we have this, we can also um, specify the type for the payload. Right? Doesn't need to be any, because remember, we can access um, the members of an object type, like this. Doesn't look like much, but, but this makes using the send method with invalid types or payloads or invalid combinations of types and payload strictly impossible without anyone having to think about it. Because type inference. We just write our basic foundation of our program, our root classes and functions in a you know more refined manner so that everybody else doesn't have to think about all the black type magic below. So let's try to use this uh, class. We create a message channel, take the port, pass it into the class, and then we get the class and we can use the send method. Answer in 42, that's okay, that's allowed. Answer and some string is not allowed. This is not a valid program, this won't compile. Um, not because answer isn't a, isn't a allowed type, it is, but um, the payload type doesn't match. Needs to be uh, something else, a string is not allowed. We can use a string payload with um, the message type question, that's okay, but not a number or any other type. We cannot even use any other message type. And the great thing is that not only that this is not only enforced um, at compile time or at authoring time rather, but there's also autocompletion in the IDE and there's no need to write any TypeScript. If you look at the code, um, behind. This looks like plain old JavaScript. All the types are inferred and it's just impossible to use the message, message port in a way that we didn't intend. And the payload as well. The payload is actually constrained the moment we complete the type. The type is answer, so the message type can only be number. There's no other option left. And the great thing is not that this is possible. Of course this is possible but no one has to think about it once they use the class. Write the class, write all the black magic you want in this class, and then it's contained in the class, doesn't escape the class, no one has to care, no one has to know it. You can just write better classes and not tell anyone about it. <sighs> the bottom line is the type system should work for us and not the other way around. We shouldn't scatter type annotations everywhere just to help the type system alone. It's supposed to be the other way around. Okay, now, now it's impossible to send messages with the wrong type or the wrong combination of types and payloads. And the next step would be a method for receiving messages. Shouldn't be too hard. We take our class again, forget about uh, send the constructor <coughs> because not important right now, and write the on method. On takes a type and a function that takes a payload. Makes sense? The function is triggered whenever the event for type happens. Okay, um, now of course you see where I'm going, right? Type is not going to be a string. Payload is not going to be any. And you know the drill by now, right? We create a type variable that's called type. Type must be one of the keys of the messages so we can get access to the type, can constrain the type to a specific subset of strings and we can say, hey, for this specific type the payload has to be of the correct type, right? Simple by now. Okay, but the implementation is the hard part because while we can just add a listener to the message port, this function will trigger for all messages. As you can see, there's no mention of the type and the signature um, for at event listener. Because this um, system of distinguishing messages by their type is not actually part of the message port, but of our class itself. So we have to implement it on top of the general message passing. How do we do this? How make, do we make sure that this function doesn't fire for every message, but just for the messages with the right type? We need something that's called a type guard. And now it's get, it gets a bit crazy. So, remember, this is our type mapping where we um, basically um, um, write out which payload belongs to which type of message, right? Now, we've already seen implicitly how our message objects look. Our message objects are objects containing a field called type and a field called payload. And of course, these are not just any string and any payload. We've constrained them to the combination outlined above. So this is not very hard to make um, a generic type out of. 
Um, but we, the important bit is that we derive this message object type from the initial mapping of types to payloads above. We don't enumerate every possible message type, we just write a general mapping. Basically, we assign payloads to messages and then everything else can be constructed from this general, um, um, general mapping. So, there's probably somewhere in your project a file called um, relationships.ts, mappings.ts, where you write the um, specific values for or the specific types for um, message types and message payloads once, and everything else is just computed from there. Now, the interesting bit about TypeScript is that it's made to work with JavaScript. And in JavaScript, there's not really something that you would consider a type system in a static type language. In JavaScript, it's more, it, it works more like duck typing. If it works like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck object. And this is actually a well-established practice in JavaScript. This is normal. And TypeScript has to interact with this. And this actually works because TypeScript provides a built-in mechanism for duck typing, basically um, turning runtime type checks into statements in TypeScript, which only exist at um, compile time. And it works like this. We write a function <coughs> that returns a boolean, but in the function signature, it ju doesn't just say returns a boolean, but it actually returns a type assertion. Object is an argument to is message object, and this here means that the function will return a boolean, but that this function has a specific meaning. This function asserts that the input object is a message type. And the implementation can just be any old JavaScript that performs duck typing. Does this object have this field and this field and this field and is it Thursday? Well, then it's going to be a message object. We can just write this out here and let this function basically communicate back to TypeScript what this function means by true or false. Okay, implementing this isn't too hard. If the object exists and it, if it has a type property and if this type property is a string, yeah, it looks like a message object, close enough. And if not, we return false. This maybe look like cowboy coding, but this is just the interface between TypeScript and JavaScript. Okay, looks reasonable. Except for this any part here, right? This function right now only tells us that any object can be some kind of message object. But far more interesting would be if we could teach this function to not only tell us if an object is some message object, but if it is a message object of a specific type. And this also includes then this object having the correct payload for this type. But of course we can do this, we just need to add a type as an argument. As you can see here, the um, return signature still says that object is message type. So um, this is really what we say, um, the argument that we say anything about type doesn't factor into this. And then of course, a type being a string, yeah, of course, then we can compare the type with not just any string, but with this specific type. This now works, but the type signature is isn't correct. Because this takes as type any string and still only tells us that the return type is some kind of message object without telling us which message object it is. But by now you know how to fix this, right? Again, we constrain the possible values for type using a type argument. Here, type can only be something that is a key of messages. We can then um, write the function signature, um, say that uh, type needs to be of the type type. Um, naming things is hard. But then we can use this uh, type argument to also um, write in the function signature that this asserts now that object is not just any message object, but a message object of a specific type. And once we've written this function, we can just throw any object in here. You can still see object is still any, so it will accept any input. But we can then um, not just check if the input is of a message type in runtime JavaScript, but we can also communicate back to TypeScript that this is the case. And this then allows us to finish our on method. Because here, in this message port event listener, we can just use this type card, check if the incoming um, event.data, the message object, conforms to the type that this listener is meant for, and only if this if statement holds true, we will actually call the function using the message object as an input. So, a bunch of TypeScript, sure, 
but this is only for um, just making this thing work as expected. So, again, we can use this um, uh, method, this new uh, on method, in the way we would expect. If we have a listener for answer, we will get a, we can uh, um, put in, we can pass in a function that takes a number, or we can pass in a function that takes nothing. This is um, a subtype of a function that takes a number, this works just fine. Um, or we can receive questions, um, them of course being strings. But any other combination is just not allowed because it wouldn't make sense in the way our message port is structured. We cannot write a wrong program, again, without doing anything. Because this is the important bit. You only write the message, message port class once, but you will use it all the time. And when you use it, there's no type annotation to be seen. It's not necessary. The IDE will tell you which message, message types are allowed, and you don't even have to write a type annotation for the function that takes the payload. Because the payload is clear. The payload is going to be a string because the type is question. No other program is possible. So why would you write the type annotation? You wouldn't. Now, this is our final uh, typed port class. And this is quite a bit of TypeScript, I admit. Some would say that TypeScript is only called TypeScript because of how much typing you do. But I'm not so sure because, again, I will only write this class once. And I will use it all the time. So I would say that this is not quite an evil spell. This is not black magic. But this is actually useful and reasonable because, of course, this is a class. Everything's private, blah, blah, blah. Everything is encapsulated and the black magic won't leak out there. It won't confuse anyone that doesn't need to open this specific file. And the black magic isn't really black magic because it's not for evil and selfish purposes. It looks scary, but it's actually to the benefit of others. No one has to know what specific incantation makes stuff just work because it just works. There's just going to be one single mapping that you will have to maintain where you assign payloads to message types. And after that, you shut your brain off and just write stuff that looks like JavaScript, but is statically checked. And this, in my opinion, is where we actually want to be. We want to write fewer types, but if we write types, they should be smarter. This again. A cheap uh, shot at uh, dynamically typed languages and statically typed languages, haha, -ha, very funny. But as I said, I think in TypeScript, if we just think about types in a different way, we can have our cake and eat it too. So this is where I want to be. I hope I, op I hope I opened your mind a bit for um, type level programming, at least a little bit. Um, Probably you're not going to walk out of here and write uh, type classes like the one I showed you before right out, of, right out of the gate, but I just want to open your mind. You can do the research yourself. The way to think about this is basically to help the type inference alone. Usually it's just, well, the type inference is a helper for us, so we don't have to write as many types. But you can also help the type inference to help you. M um, write more types that help the type inference alone, so you don't have to think about it. And this only scratches the surface. I mean, there's so much more we could talk about. This looks pretty boring. Yeah, it's a type with a type argument. But actually, you can think of this as a type function, right? Because A by itself isn't really a type, so to say, because without an argument, it doesn't produce anything that you can actually use. So you can basically write functions, factory functions, for your types. This looks scary. Um, what this does is basically make every property of an object type that you pass into this uh, type um, read-only. And this mapped type thing here is, um, is, if you read it the correct way, basically um, like a map over an array, where you just transform each and every item in the array in a specific way. In this case, we transform each and every member on the object in a specific way by adding the read-only modifier. And we can also remove the read-only modifier if we want to by just placing a minus in front of it. Work with, with read-only and with many other modifiers. Conditional types, that's exciting. If A is assignable to B, the type of C will be X. Otherwise, it will be Y. Now, this is basically an if statement for type level programming. And if you think about it, what I said before, that this is just a function for a type, a factory function for a type, you can turn this into a conditional factory function for a type if you want to. 
And then there's my personal favorite, the infer keyword. Infer down here. Basically, um, this um, triggers TypeScript, TypeScript's type inference. So, what does this monstrosity do? Uh, entry takes as t an input that's assignable to any map. A map with um, any key and any value. And then, this down here is a conditional type, a, a conditional clause, and then um, if and else. And what this basically does is, hey, TypeScript, can you use um, your type inference to figure out if t, um, if t's um, key and t's value can be inferred? Can you tell me what the type of the keys and the values is? In this case, give me a tuple type with the key and the value, and uh, otherwise just give me a tuple type with the two members just being any as a fallback, basically. So you cannot just not just use the type inference in your everyday coding, but you can also write um, well types in a programmatic way using the type inference directly using the infer keyword. But I think this is something that we're going to talk about uh, next time. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I think we have a few more minutes for questions. So thank you. Uh, remember, you can uh, write me at any time to hire me or to ask me more questions about TypeScript. But now it's time for your questions. And the question is, if we want to start with TypeScript, what kind of IDE um, would I recommend? And yeah, this would be uh, Windows Studio Code. Uh, uh, that's, uh, this is actually HTML, but this is also works very well with TypeScript. Now, other IDEs may work too, but the big advantage of this thing is that it's reasonably, reasonably fast, works on any operating system, and has TypeScript support built right into it. So Visual Studio Code gets two thumbs up from me. Thank you for your time and have a nice conference.